Welcome to the San Diego County Sheriff's Department Regional Crime Laboratory. I'm Jennifer Harmon. I'm the Crime Laboratory Director for the San Diego County Sheriff's Department Regional Crime Laboratory. This laboratory, this beautiful building, was built in 2018. We have over 150,000 square feet of laboratory and office space here. We are the second largest county in California, and the Regional Crime Laboratory in San Diego County is staffed by nearly 80 professional staff uh, with the Sheriff's Department. We have over 14 different job classifications, and we perform analysis on more than 12 forensic disciplines. We actually provide service to over 4,200 square miles of San Diego County and more than 20 regional law enforcement partners. We service every law enforcement agency, local, state, and federal within San Diego County, with the exception of the city of San Diego. We process more than 15,000 cases per year. The Crime Lab's mission is to perform accurate, reliable, timely forensic analysis by providing unbiased results to the criminal justice community. Hi, I'm Lauren Sukulis, and I'm a criminalist at the Sheriff's Department. The crime scene investigation team is a team effort and we are the first ones on scene. So we are out there to document and preserve exactly how the case was and then collect the right items to bring back to the laboratory so the people that work here, the criminalists, the evidence technicians, the latent print examiners can work really hard on trying to get the physical evidence off those items. I think the best way to think about our job is that we are speaking for the evidence. We come into every crime scene in an unbiased situation. We are there to work for the case. We're the voice of the victim. We're doing the best we can and that takes time. So crime scenes actually average anywhere from four hours to probably 12, but they can go as long as 24 hours depending on how complicated and how much evidence that we feel needs to be collected. We try to do the no stone unturned motto when we get out there and try to really overthink because we get one shot and then it's over. We are basically looking for minutia, like small details of evidence, and we don't leave until we feel like we've collected everything. And what people don't realize is that when you enter a room or enter a home or go into a vehicle, you're leaving a part of what you came with at that scene. So on the TV shows, everything's in a flash, right? It's like that night it's brought in and the next morning there's an answer. And that is pretty much almost impossible. We have to take our time and make sure that we are doing the best job possible. It takes multiple steps to get to the answer. Um, the TV shows make it look like they enter into a computer and it goes do 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 and then there's an answer and that's not true. There's still human involvement at every step. I love working for a community oriented job. I think it is the best thing for me. When I get out there, my passion is there to help whatever I need to do for those victims. It is someone's brother, sister, mom, dad, and I think everyone deserves 100% of our effort and attention. I can't imagine doing anything else, to be honest. I think this was my calling. Hello, my name is Chris Vance. I'm a criminalist too at the San Diego Sheriff's Regional Crime Laboratory. Basically, trace evidence is any little thing that can be left behind at the crime scene. That's not DNA or biology. That could be fire debris left at an arson scene. It can be shoe impressions left at a crime scene. It could be hair, paint, fibers from clothing. All of those different types of materials we can analyze and trace evidence to see if we can either associate a person, place, or thing to a crime scene, or if we can identify chemically what something is. Trace would be the footwear impression. The police would go find the suspect, they would go collect the shoes from the suspect, and then they'd submit the shoes and those images to Trace. And so our job would be to compare the impression that is at the crime scene to the shoes that the suspect has to see if we can associate him with that impression. And you go into a room and you look at people's shoes, they're almost all different. 
all different sizes, and even if they're the same brand, they may have different designs on the bottom. So that variety is great for us, and that helps us to make an association, to say this shoe or any other shoe like it could have made this impression. Drug evidence is, is similar to Trace in that I'm gonna get the evidence and I'm gonna document everything. I'm gonna document its packaging, I'm gonna document what it looks like. I have a different type of lab coat on, I may be wearing a respirator, and I'm gonna be working in a hood to make sure, especially if it's powder, it's not getting everywhere for my safety. And then basically I'll document and open the evidence, I'll take it out, I'll weigh it, the evidence, how much of that drug is there, and then I'll take a sample of it and start doing my tests. I'll do color tests, I could do microcrystal tests, I could put it on the FTIR, I could put it on the GCMS. So whereas a trace case could take a couple days, a week, a month, a drug case usually takes you 15, 30 minutes to an hour. I love solving problems. So every case I get, I get to solve a problem, uh, especially for trace. There's no really cookie cutter by the numbers trace case because things are always different. So it's all about solving problems. What can I tell a jury from this evidence? Hi, I'm Gina Hunter and I'm a forensic document examiner. As a forensic document examiner, we look at documents which are trying to portray a message or a meaning. This can be anything from a journal or a handwritten letter to a machine-generated contract. We look at them to determine their authenticity or their authorship. In this case, the first thing I did was look at it under the microscope. So I'm looking to determine, is this an original document? So then I took the document and placed it in the video spectral comparator. And this instrument uses different filters and radiations of light and light sources to look at things outside of the visible spectrum. With the VSC, we can see into infrared and ultraviolet light and look at things such as security features on documents. We can differentiate inks to see, is this document written with the same kind of ink or were two different inks used? Next, I took the document into the ESDA room, the humidity controlled room because humidity kind of activates damaged fibers on a piece of paper. So the ESDA allows us to develop indented impressions on paper. So when you're writing in a notebook or writing on a stack of pages, if you're using a lot of pressure, you're leaving indented impressions on the pages underneath. And this instrument allows us to develop those indented impressions and make them readable. So on this particular document, there was a phone number in the upper portion of the document and some handwriting in the bottom right corner. And then in the middle of the document, you can see that the white void of where the ballpoint ink is on the original document itself. I think the most interesting part about my job is that every piece of evidence is different. And even though it may be another currency case or another will case or another jail mail, there's always something different about the evidence which makes every case unique and you learn something new the more cases that you're doing in this field. Hi, my name is David Martinez, and I'm a latent print examiner with the San Diego Sheriff's Crime Lab. A latent prints uh, would be helpful on any case. Fingerprints are left by chance as long as the surface is conducive to receiving a fingerprint impression, and that impression is transferred onto that surface, then we can use it to identify an individual and exclude an individual. On our fingers, we have three basic patterns. We have a loop, a whirl, and an arch. So the arrangement of those features and their location is unique to every person. So when we're looking at fingerprints, we're looking at that detail. So you need some type of lighting, special lighting, or you need some type of powder to make it visible, or some type of chemical process to make it visible to the eye. And that is what we call a latent print. Mainly what I would do would be to screen the latent prints with the, my magnifying glass. Today in this age, we have some great tools such as a software called Photoshop. And then we have the tools such as a scanner and a computer. So you can mark several features and use what we call target groups, something that we can recognize and memorize in the latent print so that when we go and look at the known print record, 
we're looking for those same features to see if we can find similarities. So there are a lot of misconceptions uh, about our job and our discipline. Uh, just like how you might see on the TV shows that an impression is put into the system and then it goes through several faces and within two seconds it then reads match. That is all uh, Hollywood production. Uh, the reality is that we have to spend a little bit of time analyzing the impression. If it's a very complex print, it could take even longer. For me, it's very satisfying. It gives me a sense that I was able to not only help solve a crime, but also to give possibly the family some type of closure at the end. Uh, I think that's what keeps us all going, is that we want to be able to solve the crime, have a piece in it. My name's Alexis, and I'm a criminalist in the Forensic Biology section of the Sheriff's Crime Lab. The Forensic Biology Unit at the Sheriff's Lab examines evidence for the presence of biological material. We develop DNA profiles, and we make comparisons to those DNA profiles. DNA is left behind at crime scenes in a variety of ways. You can get DNA from where someone touched something, from a body fluid, if they leave behind blood or saliva, anything really that your body comes in contact with. When I'm looking at a shirt that has staining on it, I will test potential stains with chemical tests looking for blood. I can also take samples to determine who may have been wearing the shirt by swabbing the inside of the collar and the underarms. Once I've determined what sample to collect, I isolate the DNA in the sample, and that's done by adding heat and chemicals. We'd like to know, in a lot of situations, who was wearing the shirt or who the shirt may have belonged to and whose staining is on the shirt. After I know how much DNA is in the sample, I use additional chemicals and another instrument that works like a copy machine. It looks at the specific locations that we're interested in as forensic scientists and makes enough copies of those locations that we're able to view it on a final instrument which creates or shows us a DNA profile and a picture representation. While DNA technology has evolved to be able to get profiles from very small samples, that doesn't mean we'll always get something from a crime scene sample. DNA has to be in good condition if it's been exposed to heat or light or it's been there a really long time. Sometimes the profile is broken down to a point that we can't really analyze it. Uh, typically, our best samples are blood stains and body fluid stains because they have the largest amount of DNA present. Hi, I'm Ryan Otten, and I'm a criminalist at the San Diego Sheriff's Crime Lab. I analyze blood samples for a blood alcohol concentration. I calibrate and maintain the breath alcohol instruments used throughout the county by officers, and I also testify to the results and interpretation of that evidence in court. In order to determine a person's blood alcohol concentration, we first take the one blood vial, and then we take just a few drops of that blood, and we put that into what's called a headspace vial, and this is the vial that will be used for analysis. We prepare that in duplicate, so there's two headspace vials for every one blood vial, and then that gets run on the instrument as well as all of the calibrators and controls. Once the sample has finished analyzing, the results are then exported and printed from the gas chromatograph, and that's included in our report that we publish. Headspace gas chromatography is essentially a separation technique. We're looking to identify how much ethanol, specifically, is in a person's blood sample. So right now, we're in the breath alcohol room, and this is the room where we calibrate and maintain breath alcohol instruments that are used in the county. When a person blows into the breath alcohol instrument, there are two components at work. The first is the infrared detector, which monitors the quality of the sample that's being provided to the instrument. Secondly, a small portion of that person's air enters the electrochemical fuel cell, where the alcohol in the person's breath reacts with a catalyst inside the instrument to produce an electrical current. And that electrical current is proportional to the amount of alcohol in the person's breath. 
Our samples are kept in one of two locations. Uh, the first is for the most evidence, and that's in our large walk-in refrigerator. Those samples are stored for at least one year. Our other samples, such as cases from sexual assaults or murders, those are stored with property and evidence, and those are stored for a longer time period. Hi, I'm Scott Hoops. I'm the technical lead criminalist of the Firearms Analysis Unit of the Sheriff's Crime Lab. In my role in the Firearms Analysis Unit, I look at firearms that are submitted, expended cartridge cases, fired bullets, ammunition, anything firearm related. So I'll analyze the firearm to determine what kind of firearm it is, whether it's working properly. We fire firearms into this water tank if we need to recover both the expended cartridge cases and the fired bullets for comparison. It allows us to collect, in a lot of cases, almost pristine bullets that have all of their individual unique markings intact without any damage. I'll look at the evidence cartridge cases in comparison to the test fired cartridge cases using a comparison microscope. We also have a, a range side where we can shoot into these heavy rubber blocks that encapsulate and contain the fired bullets. We can fire on that side if we just need expended cartridge cases and no bullets, or if we need to do additional testing. One other type of analysis we do here in the laboratory is referred to as serial number restoration. Occasionally, someone will deface or obliterate the serial number on a firearm uh, in order to hide its origin or identity. In those cases, depending on the depth of the obliteration, we can sometimes bring those characters back using a number of different physical restoration and chemical restoration techniques. A lot of the evidence that I'm looking at is different. I don't know what I'm getting into from day to day. And a lot of it requires some tinkering, some, some problem solving to make sure that a firearm is working properly. And if it's not working properly, figuring out what's wrong with it and what I can do to make it work properly so that we can collect these test fired components. I think the most important thing that we want to share is that the laboratory is funded by you, by our taxpayers. You are our jurors and you're also our potential future recruits. So we'd like you to get a real understanding of what it takes to run a crime lab, the types of disciplines that we participate in, and the amazing work that the staff are doing here at the San Diego County Sheriff's Department Regional Crime Lab.